Hello, my name is Dan Popescu. I'm an investment advisor specializing in precious metals and more specifically gold and silver and also covering the international monetary system. It's always a pleasure to speak to my guest uh, of today, uh, Jim Rickards. <clears throat> He's uh, the New York Times bestseller author of Currency Wars, The Death of Money, The New Case for Gold and The Road to Ruin. He's the chief global strategist for Meraglin, editor of the newsletter Strategic Intelligence and a member of the advisory board of the Center for Financial Economics at uh, John Hopkins, an advisor on international economics and financial threats to the Department of Finance, uh, the Department of uh, Defense and the U.S. intelligence community. Hello, Jim. Hi, Dan. Great to be with you. It's great to have you again. Uh, we spoke uh, just before the election uh, when you came uh, came out with uh, uh, the road to ruin, and before that, in uh, I think it was April or March, April, when we spoke about, uh, about the new case for gold. So, uh, uh, with the election passed, it's a, it's a great time to come back. You just uh, uh, published. Uh, the paper uh, cover uh, version of uh, the death of money, which is uh, uh, one of my favorites because it's uh, uh, covering the, uh, the coming collapse of the international monetary system. And uh, I don't know anybody better to speak about the international monetary system than you. You are uh, my favorite and the most knowledgeable person I'm going to just do a, a very short preamble for the, for the auditors, uh, to, for the viewers uh, of the international monetary system. In 1944, we had the Bretton Woods Accords uh, that were signed, which started uh, the gold exchange, uh, uh, monet international monetary system. And in 1961, it started getting in trouble and uh, major central banks of Europe and the United States uh, Canada created uh, uh, what's called the London Gold Pool, which was supposed to protect and to save uh, the, uh, the Bretton Woods, uh, Woods Accords. Uh, it failed, and a year later, the, uh, the International Monetary Fund created uh, what's called what was supposed to be an international currency, uh, the Special Drawing Rights, uh, SDRs. And interesting enough, uh, uh, they were first defined in 10% uh, 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 less than a gram of, uh, of gold. So uh, the, the international currency, when it was created in 1969, it was almost one gram of gold. And uh, just two years later, in 71, uh, Bretton Woods Accords collapsed, and in 73, uh, the uh, they, uh, they switched, they changed the SDRs from gold to 16 fiat currencies, paper currencies. And I want to mention uh, also a note uh, that was sent by, uh, 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 by, the for, uh, by the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for International Finance and Development, Mr. Weintraub, to the Under Secretary of the Treasury for Monetary Affairs of that time, Paul Volcker, which became the, the governor, governor of the Federal Reserve. And uh, he said in that note to Paul Volcker that U.S. objectives for the world monetary system is a durable, stable system with the SDR as the strong reserve asset at, it, at its center and it's incompatible with continued important role for gold as a reserve, uh, uh, reserve uh, currency. And he, uh, he also says that uh, uh, it is the U.S. concerns that any substantial increase now in the price of, of uh, which official gold transactions are made will strengthen the position of gold in the system and cripple the SDRs. I wanted to mention this, Jim, because, uh, as I said, you're the best and the one that knows and has studied the, the international monetary system from the beginning, from, from the end of the 60s. Rare people know it, and it comes into your book, into uh, 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 the preface that you wrote for the death of uh, money. Uh, you say, uh, 
you, you say that uh, uh, the only feasible alternative to the dollar dominance are special drawing rights issued by the IMF and gold. And you also mentioned uh, uh, in the book, in the original uh, uh, book, that uh, uh, the SDRs will be gold back and freely convertible into gold or the local currencies. That's what I want to ask you first, Jim. You seem to have a, a lot of people with whom I talk and I mentioned you, they say, well, he's a paper guy. He likes the SDR. But that's not the SDR because you talk in the book about an SDR, the original SDR linked to gold. Could you elaborate and explain a little bit what you think about the gold and the SDR and the international monetary system? Uh, well, thank you, Dan. Uh, and thanks for the kind words uh, about my books and uh, the amount of financial history I cover. Obviously, you're very familiar with this uh, yourself and, uh, and uh, quite well acquainted with the financial history. And you're right, not that many uh, people are. I, I think I would, I would say a couple of things just to kind of uh, you know, unpack the introduction. Um, the Death of Money is a book that came out in 2014. It was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, but what's coming out now, and again, what we're, we're talking about is um, the paperback edition. It's actually sold very well in hardcover. Usually publishers come out with a paperback edition within a year of the hardcover and just kind of continue the sales that way. But The Death of Money continued to sell very well in hardcover for years, but now it's three years later and it is coming out uh, in the new paperback edition. But we have new material and a new preface that I put a lot of time and effort into that, that updates uh, The Death of Money. And what it mainly says is that if you look at all the things I talked about in the book, they have all played out more or less the way we described them. We talked in chapter four about uh, weaknesses in China. That has only gotten worse. Their, their debt levels have gone up. Um, their instability is greater. Their bad debts are greater. Uh, China is getting closer to uh, a crisis, whether it's a credit crisis or a uh, foreign exchange crisis because the reserves are going down. I also talk quite a bit about gold uh, countries, specifically Russia and China acquiring gold. That has continued. China has continued to add thousands of tons to its gold reserves. Russia has tripled its gold reserves in the last 10 years, almost doubled them since I wrote uh, The Death of Money. So all the main uh, points we talked about. Also, financial warfare is getting more intense uh, with more activity by North Korea. We have Russia, China, Iran, and Turkey have formed what I call the axis of gold. Uh, that's more recent. But all these things we talked about in The Death of Money, and they've all played out. Uh, and also the purpose has new information about insider trading ahead of the 9-11 attack, which was very well established. But, but since I wrote the book, since the death of money came out in 2014, certain individuals have come forward. They said, Jim, I've read your book and what you said about insider trading ahead of 9-11. Let me tell you my own story. Let me tell you what I saw. So there's, there are things that I did not include in the hard cover simply because I didn't know about them. But people have come forward really to unburden themselves of these stories. So that's all in there. So I hope the readers enjoy that. Getting to your specific point, Dan, um, you know, it's, I, I don't favor or disfavor the SDR. It's not a question of my personal preferences. I'm an analyst. Uh, what I write about and what I talk about is what I see coming, the dynamics of the international monetary system. So I like to say, yeah, I have personal opinions on everything, but what I think doesn't really matter. What matters is what's happening. What what do the central banks think? What do the monetary authorities think? That's the kind of analysis I do. So all I'm really doing, I'm warning people or describing for people what's coming, whether I like it or not, is, you know, interesting. We can have a, a side discussion on that, but it's irrelevant. What matters is, is what's actually coming. And clearly, the SDR is out there for a purpose. Now, the reason I, uh, I mentioned it specifically and so prominently in, in The Death of Money, I mentioned it in my other books as well, but uh, there's a lot on the SDR and the role of the IMF as the central bank of the world in the death of money. The reason I talk about that is um, you go back over the last two major global financial crises. One was 1998, that involved a Russian default. It started in Asia, spread to Russia, and then ended up really in my lap at a hedge fund called Long Term Capital Management. Uh, which uh, was, was caught in the crossfire, lost an enormous amount of money, had to be rescued by Wall Street, and I negotiated that rescue that that, uh, that occurred. So um, I had a front row seat on that one. I know just how dangerous it was. Uh, and then, of course, we have the 2008 crisis. I think 
listeners are much more familiar with. Now, here's the point. In both times, in 1998 and 2008, the international monetary system was either hours or perhaps days away from complete collapse. And when I say collapse, I'm talking about the sequential failure of major investment banks, major commercial banks, a crash of stock markets, bond markets, perhaps actually having to close exchanges temporarily, freeze accounts, and much, much worse than what actually transpired. In 1998, Wall Street rescued a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks rescued Wall Street. What's going to happen in the next crisis, let's say 2018, just to keep up the 10-year tempo? It could be tomorrow, it could be later than that, but uh, 2018 is a good frame of reference for this purpose. Who's going to bail out the central banks? You know, as each crisis gets bigger than the one before, each rescue gets bigger than the one before, we're now at the point where the capacity of the central banks to bail out the system is gone. I mean, they just take uh, the Federal Reserve, our own U.S. central bank, but this is true of all the major central banks, but just take the U.S. Federal Reserve as an example. In the last crisis in 2008, they took their balance sheet from about $800 billion to over $4 trillion. They printed uh, about $3.5 trillion of new money. If somehow they had normalized, if they had got the uh, balance sheet back to, let's say, $800 billion or even $1 trillion, I would be the first to compliment them. I'd say, hey, nice job. You know, you, you, you bailed out the system, you normalized your balance sheet, now you're ready for the next one. That's not what happened. The balance sheet is still extended. It's still over $4 trillion. So what are they going to do when the next crisis hits? Take it to $8 trillion, $12 trillion? I mean, the point is, they're at the outer limit. They Legally, they could, but they'll destroy confidence in the process, and that's just another way to collapse the system. So they're going to need uh, a bigger bailout. It's like that uh, line from the movie Jaws, where Robert Shaw, uh, you know, sees, well, I guess it's uh, one of the other, uh, uh, Richard Dreyfuss, uh, comes in and says, you know, he sees the shark, um, and he says, we're going to need a bigger boat. Well, in the next crisis, we're going to need a bigger bailout. And then that begs the question, where will it come from? There are really only two sources. One is gold. You could restore confidence with gold. But to do that, you're going to have to have a much higher price um, because just looking at the ratio of gold to money supply, people say there's not enough gold to bail out the system. Well, there's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. Uh, the current level of around uh, $1,250 an ounce. Uh, no, that doesn't work. You'd have to reduce the money supply in order to use gold um, as interchangeable with money, and that would be highly deflationary. So the other solution, given the amount of money that's out there, is just to increase the dollar price of gold. Then the same amount of gold can support a larger money supply. But I've done that math. It's not complicated. That number is at least $10,000 an ounce, perhaps much higher depending on the, the percentage backing you need. The other solution is the special drawing right. This is world money. Um, people make it complicated. It's a funny name. They call it the special drawing right or the SDR. Just think of it as world money. Uh, right now it's a fiat currency printed by the IMF. So the Federal Reserve can print dollars. The European Central Bank can print euros. Well, the IMF can print SDRs and hand them out to their members. And they have in the past. This is nothing new. Uh, as you correctly point out, it was invented in 1969. Uh, it was designed to be a substitute for the dollar. It was never really needed for that purpose because uh, it looked like we were heading that way in the late 60s, early 70s. But what happened in the mid-1970s is President Nixon and Henry Kissinger structured the petrodollar deal where the Arabs agreed to accept dollars for oil and not to dump the dollars, but to actually put them back in the U.S. banks and then the U.S. banks could lend them to developing economies who would buy goods from the United States. So that was the, the petrodollar recycling. We, we printed dollars. The Arabs accepted the dollars for oil, gave us the oil, took the dollars, put them in the U.S. banks. The banks lent money to Brazil and Argentina and Mexico, who then went out and bought U.S. manufactured goods. I mean, this was true all over the world, Japanese goods, etc. We got the whole system going again. So as the petrodollar global bank recycling. By the way, I worked at Citibank in the, uh, in the mid to late 1970s and early 1980s, so I also saw this firsthand, spoke with uh, Walter Riston, who is the legendary chairman and CEO of Citibank, and uh, he gave me some very valuable insights into this process. So once the petrodollar deal was struck and the petrodollar recycling got going, we didn't need the SDR because the dollar liquidity sufficed. But by then we were unanchored, and then of course you have the um, uh, the, the King Dollar period, uh, Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan restored confidence in the dollar. So ever since then, 
from 1980, let's say, to up to 2010, we've had a sound dollar policy, not a gold standard, but you know, if you have confidence in the dollar, that works also. The problem is now confidence in the dollar is hanging by a thread. Uh, too many dollars were printed in the last bailout. Um, we're, we're in the currency wars, we're too far gone, uh, too far away from gold. So in the next collapse, which you can definitely see coming, um, the confidence in the dollar will be lost. That's what the death of money is all about. When I say the death of money, people say, well, what do you mean by that? Does it mean there's no more money? No, there'll always be some form of money. Uh, people are very creative when it comes to that. In the Great Depression, they actually, uh, when, when there was a shortage of money, local communities came up with uh, wooden nickels. They had wooden money, and uh, they exchanged it among themselves locally for you know, a barbershop or a, uh, you know, a, a grocer or whatever. It's just this way to get money going. And, if they share confidence, then it works. So, so now we're at the point of the next crisis, um, the IMF is going to roll out the SDRs. Here's my question. If the crisis is precipitated, or one of the results is a loss of confidence in dollars, euros, yen, other forms of money, why would we have any more confidence in the SDR? The answer is we might, partly because nobody understands it, it would just be out there, the liquidity would be there. We still have dollars in our pockets, although this would be a highly inflationary development. One more reason to have gold. Um, but it might work because no one understands it. But it might not work. People would say, wait a second, we've lost confidence in this other money. Why should we have any more confidence in the SDR? At that point, you only have one choice, which is gold. You could have a gold-backed SDR, which I, which I also talked about and you mentioned. So you've got sort of, think of it as a two horses in the race, gold and SDRs. See, gold wins either way. If you go to a gold-backed SDR, you're gonna have this much, you're gonna have to have this much higher price I described. If you don't go to a gold-backed SDR and you just go to SDRs, that's gonna be highly inflationary and the dollar price of gold is gonna blow up. So gold wins either way. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I am, I, I outline, I read your book again uh, during the week and I was surprised how actual and how uh, uh, timely it still is. Uh, you you talk uh, uh, when you talk about uh, the new gold standard, uh, you say only a global gold standard can avoid the deflation that would accompany an uh, uh, an effort by United States to go it alone. That's what something I was thinking about with uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, being elected president, because in uh, uh, in the speeches that he made, uh, interviews that he made. It's evident he understands gold, uh, the role of gold as money. Uh, he has a perfect idea, in my view, uh, about uh, gold, uh, a dollar, uh, a gold uh, dollar back, uh, backed, go, uh, gold dollar <laughs> backed. So uh, he has a very good idea of that. Uh, but also in a in a neat, uh, in a speech to the conservative uh, a conservative group of, a few weeks ago, he didn't mention any SDR or international money as if uh, it didn't exist. Uh, something that I would be surprised because he's very knowledgeable, but he seemed to completely ignore the idea of an international currency. So in the negotiations, could uh, could uh, could Donald Trump prefer uh, backing the dollar with gold, going it alone, or could we see uh, an SDR backed by gold? Because in that case, you'll get consensus at the uh, at the, the IMF level, because the Chinese are in favor openly, the Russians are in favor, the European Union, even since the 70s, they were in favor of uh, supporting gold. And now you have in the United States Donald Trump, who doesn't like SDR, but he likes gold. What do you think about it? Well, it's a very important question, Dan. You make some good points. And that is one of the, the really new developments since the death of money came out. But all the work in the death of money um, is actually highly relevant to that analysis. Now, here's the point. Yes, Donald Trump has said some very positive things about gold. He hasn't said, you know, we have to go back to a gold standard, but he has said, you know, I kind of, um, you know, look, look back at the days of the gold standard. It seemed like a much better idea. Uh, so he has said some positive things about gold. He's also surrounded by at least some of his um, economic advisors who are very positive about gold. One of them, uh, Dr. Judy Shelton, who has yeah. written a book on the subject. Uh, others uh, certainly uh, 
Steve Moore, David Nalpass, uh, Larry Cudlow, et cetera, favor, if not a gold standard, at least a strong dollar or some reference to gold. So Trump himself and some of his advisors, people around him, have said some very positive things about gold. I haven't heard anything on SDRs, but you know, that's not really surprising. The SDR is highly technical. I've uh, I've run into PhDs in international economics, people who are true experts who cannot give sort of straight answers or at least correct answers on how SDRs work. And so it's a little bit technical. I wouldn't necessarily expect him uh, to be uh, to be expert on that. I mean, smart guy he could be briefed on it. I'm sure and get up to speed pretty quickly, but uh, not really something I would expect him uh, to know very much uh, about the moment. But um, to your point, and this is, this is very important. So let's say this financial crisis that we can see coming happen uh, tomorrow or happened uh, you know, a month or even a year from now when, when Trump is president. What would his reaction function be? Because it was fairly easy to say what, what Obama would do. And it was fairly easy to say what Hillary Clinton would do. They're globalists. They're internationalists. They're very close to uh, the international monetary elite. And it's not some deep, dark conspiracy. I mean, it's uh, Christine Lagarde at the IMF. It's... Uh, David Lipton, first deputy managing director, who is still in place, by the way, um, more of an Obama protege, uh, not imagine he's not particularly fond of Trump. You know, Mario Draghi, etc. These are we know who these people are. They are they are running the international monetary system. So either Obama or Hillary Clinton would have just turned to them, and you would have had something very much like what I described, which is an effort to use the SDR to, to create global liquidity to bail out the system. Now, Trump, uh, I agree, is much more of a go-it-alone kind of guy. He's, he's the anti-globalist, he's the nationalist, uh, and the U.S. is in a position to do that. We have 8,000 tons of gold, uh, the only uh, party with uh, more gold, the European monetary system collectively, not any one country, but all of the uh, 19 members of the European monetary system together have 10,000 tons of gold. Uh, so they have 10, Europe has 10,000, the U.S. has 8,000. Um, no one else comes close. The IMF itself, by the way, has almost 3,000 tons of gold. It's always interesting to hear these international monetary institutions disparage gold. And I say, well, if you're against gold, why do you have 3,000 tons? Why is that so important to you? So, um, so there is that gold still is at the heart of the international monetary system, even though no one cares to admit it because they, why should they? They want this, they want the paper money, they want the fiat currency system that they control to dominate why would they voluntarily, voluntarily give up power? The answer is they wouldn't, but they might have to involuntarily give up power in, in a crisis. So, so here's, but here's the, here's the problem, here's the danger. Trump has thought about gold. I doubt he's thought very much about SDRs, but he could become acquainted to that. But the minute you talk about gold, either a strict gold standard or something like it, you have to wrestle with the issue of price. And this was one of the greatest monetary blunders, or I would say probably the greatest single monetary blunder of the 20th century, and maybe the greatest of all time, which was in 1925, after World War I, the UK was preparing to go back to the gold standard. Technically, it was called the gold exchange standard uh, at the time. Now, before World War I, uh, the entire world, or uh, most of the world, certainly all the developed economies, major economies at the time, were on a strict gold standard. The U.S. it was about twenty dollars an ounce uh, for an ounce of gold. Uh, the U.K. It was uh, four pounds seventy-five. You know, the same thing based on the exchange rate. And all the other major trading powers were in gold. You you linked your currency to gold, which meant that they were all linked to each other because all you had to do was just transit the law, you know, just convert. Uh, so you had a true gold standard prior to 1914. Immediately upon the outbreak of World War I, all the major countries abandoned uh, gold convertibility. They, they still had their gold, but they were no longer willing to ship it or exchange it or make their currencies convertible into gold because they knew they would need the gold to fight World War I. The UK and the US stayed on it, the UK more nominally than really. But then once you got after World War I, after the Treaty of Versailles in the 1920s, countries wanted to go back to the gold standard. But the problem was, at what price? They had, the UK is a good example. They, they, they started out before World War I with a gold paper money parity. Okay, there was, there was a fixed value for, for the pound sterling. They doubled the money supply to fight World War I. You always do. I mean, wars are existential. You do what you have to do. So now you're going to go back to the gold standard. You have two choices. You can cut the money supply in half and get back to the old parity, or you can double the price of gold, which is just recognizing the new reality. The right thing to do would be to double the price of gold. That would have been a recognition, hey, we printed all this money, 
too bad, but we had to win World War One. We had to fight the war, and now we're recognizing reality. And in effect, you're going to get, at least for the short run, an extreme version of inflation. That's not what the UK did. Winston Churchill, Chancellor of the Exchequer, felt duty bound and honor bound to go back to the old parity. And that's an honorable intention, but it didn't recognize the reality that they doubled the money supply. They cut the money supply in half. It was extremely deflationary. It put the UK in a depression for three years before the rest of the world. I mean, the, the Great Depression is conventionally dated to 1929 when the US stock market crashed, but um, it really started in the UK before that, 1926, uh, in the aftermath of this decision. So, and Churchill later admitted that. He, he said it was the greatest blunder of my career, So, um, uh, which was a major statement. So the point is, uh, the sentiment going back to the gold standard was correct, but they got the price wrong. They picked the deflationary price. Now, flash forward to today. If you want to go to a gold standard today, or even use gold as a reference point for SDRs or dollars, um, it can't be $1,250 an ounce, which is where it is today. That would repeat the mistake of 1925. That would be the equivalent of going back at the wrong price, just because we've printed so much money. We've printed uh, the, the money supply so much. So what is the implied non-deflationary price of gold? What would the price of gold have to be? So let's just say you take the existing money supply of the major economies, assume 40% backing. I'm not even assuming 100% backing, just 40% backing. And then look at the 33,000 tons of official gold. I mean, we, we have all this information. This is not a mystery. It's not even, the math is not even that difficult. It's not calculus or, or something more, more daunting. It's, it's eighth grade math. So just divide the $24 trillion money supply Assume 40% backing, that's $9.6 trillion of gold, and look at 33,000 tons and do the math. The answer is very close to $10,000 an ounce. So if you want to go there, I think it's a, it might be a good idea. It might be necessary to restore confidence, but you have to be honest about the price. I, I doubt Trump has held that briefing. I, I think very few people have thought about it in the context of Churchill's mistake of 1925 and said to themselves, what would the price have to be? By the way, one of the people who has thought about it, he's spoken about it publicly, is Paul Volcker. Now, Paul Volcker does not advocate a gold standard, but he's at least honest about the fact that if you had a gold standard, the price would have to be significantly higher. And I, I quote this in, uh, I quote this in The Death of Money, um, and uh, again, I've done the math, and the answer is $10,000 an ounce. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I, as I said, I was, uh, I am impressed about the amount of knowledge. Uh, I also have to say that uh, people should read all your three, four books together, uh, from Currency Wars uh, to uh, The Death of Money. Uh, each, each one of them, it's one step in the process, and uh, you get a great idea from, from the four books of the International Monetary System, and, and as I said, I know very few people who have followed it since the beginning uh, so well. And your analysis or projecting uh, based on, on facts, based on, on history of what might, uh, might happen. Uh, I would also want to ask you, you, you talk in the book also about uh, the Triffin uh, uh, dilemma. And uh, uh, how would that... Uh, 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 briefly, how would that uh, happen, uh, solve the problem if we go to the SDR, which is not backed by gold, because you talk about an SDR uh, in the book uh, uh, backed by gold, uh, a two-tier uh, SDR you talk about, and uh, uh, also in one of your newsletters you, you discuss uh, at length uh, the Triffin dilemma that could be solved by the uh, the printing of of SDRs. Sure, uh, Dan, let me first explain what Triffin's dilemma is, and then talk a little bit about how the SDR is a possible solution to Triffin's dilemma. So, uh, Triffin's dilemma was named after an econ Belgian economist, Robert Triffin. Uh, he articulated this in the early 1960s, so it's uh, you know quite old, more than uh, more than 50 years old. Um, and this was during the period of Bretton Woods that you mentioned earlier, and that system said that the dollar was linked to gold, and then all the other currencies were linked to the dollar or the fixed exchange rate, so indirectly they were linked to gold. Uh, but they could devalue with permission from the IMF, this was one of the, the, the roles of the IMF to manage those occasional devaluations, but the one link you could not break was the dollar. 
The dollar could not devalue against gold. Of course, ultimately it did, but at least those were the rules of the game uh, as was understood at the time. So the dollar was the major source of liquidity in the world. Um, and what Triffin said is that, well, in order to get the world financial system going, the world trading system going, remember this was not that long after World War II, there had been so much destruction. Um, uh, Japan and Germany were still rebuilding. Uh, for, for that matter, you'd have the Korean War even more recently. The, the Korean Peninsula was devastated. Uh, China was, uh, was, was a mess. Um, uh, and so not really participating in the international monetary system, neither was the Soviet Union. So the whole, the whole world wanted dollars. Dollars were the source of liquidity. And Triffin said, well, if the world needs dollars, how do they get them? They trade with the United States and they run a surplus. So that means the U.S. runs a deficit. In other words, in order to supply the, the world with dollars needed to get commerce and trade moving, the U.S. had to run persistent deficits, which we did, both trade deficits and budget deficits. So we did a pretty good job of pumping out dollars for the rest of the world. But the dilemma was, Trippin said, if you run persistent deficits, eventually you go broke. And he was right. Now, it took 50 years, but today the United States is going broke. We have, uh, we've had persistent trade deficits. We've only had one or two trade surpluses uh, in that time. And we've had persistent budget deficits. Again, a couple uh, budget surpluses uh, under Nixon and Clinton, but just a, just a few, just two or three, but persistent deficits all along. So, so we pumped out the dollars, but we run deficits. We're in the process of going broke. The U.S. debt to GDP ratio is 105%. Um, the highest since World War II, but actually much higher because of all the off-balance sheet liabilities for Medicare, Medicaid, student loans, uh, veterans um, loans, the federal home loan bank system, uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. You know, you look at all the obligations of the U.S. government, we're far, far more indebted than we were even at the end of World War II. Um, and so, uh, so how do you get out of this? How do you pump out dollars to run the global economy without going broke? That was Triffin's dilemma. Well, the solution is to to use SDRs. In other words, the U.S. could fix its deficits, could reduce its uh, trade deficit, actually run a trade surplus if it wanted to, kind of cut off the dollar supply of the rest of the world, but you would substitute with SDRs. And the reason it solves Triffin's dilemma is because the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which prints SDRs, is not a country. The IMF doesn't have a trade deficit. The IMF doesn't have a budget deficit. It just prints the money. So finally, you have a source of liquidity that's not a country. It's basically the central bank of the world, and it's unlimited, unconstrained in the amount of liquidity it can provide without actually worried about loss of credit uh, or um, people losing confidence in it because it's not a country, it doesn't have a trade deficit. That's the theory, and that's one of the reasons the SDR was invented. It was a solution to trip is lot. But the reality, again, uh, you can say that you can print it on unlimited quantities, but can you really? I mean, will individuals lose confidence? Now, here's the point. Individuals don't get SDRs. SDRs are money for countries. Uh, they're given to the members of the IMF. You and I will never have SDRs in our pockets. We'll have whatever local currency we use. It could be dollars or Swiss francs or euros or Japanese yen. You know, the dollar will still be around. But it will be a local currency like the Mexican peso. You know, if I go to Mexico, I get some Mexican pesos. If you come to the United States, you'll get some U.S. dollars to spend locally. But it will no longer be the benchmark global reserve currency. That will be the SDR. But if it works, it will only be because no one understands it. We won't have SDRs in our pockets. Countries will have them in the reserve positions. They can use it to pay for oil. They can use it to settle the balance of payments. They can use it for direct foreign investment and other uh, things that countries typically use reserves for, but um, no one will have them in their pockets. So it's kind of an invisible reserve currency, uh, if you want to think about it that way. It could work, but it will, at, at best, at best, it would be highly inflationary. At worst, it won't work because people will see through the uh, uh, the kind of uh, you know this deception, and uh, you'll have to go to gold. Yeah, I, I always come back when you mention that to a to a sentence from a, from a chapter you wrote in in a book uh, edited by uh, Sarah Eisen, Currencies in the uh, after the crash, where you say, when all else fails, possibly including the new SDR plan, gold is always waiting in the wings, a stable, widely accepted store of value and universal money. 
Uh, I like that, uh, that sentence. And you mentioned also in the new case for gold, gold and the SDR uh, are the two most likely outcomes of, uh, of any reset uh, uh, collapse. I just want to touch at the last point. Uh, you also talk in the book, and uh, just this morning I read on Reuters, uh, and in the last few days, uh, uh, concerning the scandal of that, uh, that stealing money from, uh, from the central bank uh, uh, of uh, Bangladesh. And there was an article this morning that the United States is uh, uh, having some speculation. It's not yet uh, sure that it's North Korea. And you talked in the, in the, in the, the debt of money about uh, geopolitical insider trading. Could you uh, say a, a few words about it? Sure. And again, uh, the, the, that, the hardcover is four years, uh, uh, sorry, three years old, but the, the paperback's brand new. We have new material on this, specifically the question of financial warfare. So just to kind of uh, recap for the listeners, what uh, viewers, what happened with uh, Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, it kept its reserves uh, on deposit with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which in theory is the most, is the strongest bank in the world. So you have the poorest country in the world, one of uh, Bangladesh, keeping its savings, its national savings, on deposit with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Eighty-one million dollars went missing, was stolen. Um, and I, I like to say that if uh, Bangladesh had kept the reserves in physical gold, they'd still have the money. Uh, they, these were digital dollars. Uh, uh, that were that were diverted and stolen. So, uh, but they would have been better off with physical gold. They would still have the money. But be that as it may, uh, that money is is missing. It's gone now. Obviously, it was a crime committed. The question is who did it, um, and that was not really clear at the time. Some wire transfers were traced to the Philippines, but then the, the trail went cold. It now appears, this is not definitive, but it now appears that it was uh, an attack by North Korea, which was not just a heist. Yeah, sure, it was a bank bank heist, uh, uh, you know, the form of theft, if you want to think of it that way, and North Korea needs the hard currency. Bear in mind, the money is completely fungible, fungible and it's digital, so if I have digital dollars that I can send to a Chinese bank and use to pay for shipments of gold, for example, um, then you can't trace it uh, once you wash it, once you wander it through uh, through the banking system or, or through SWIFT. Uh, but this is a form of financial warfare because what's North Korea doing with the money? They're developing nuclear weapons. They're developing ICBMs. They're miniaturizing and ruggedizing their nuclear warheads. They've got enough plutonium and highly enriched uranium for 10 weapons. They're not that far away, probably just three years, maybe four at the most, from being able to, to fire uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles and nuclear warheads on Los Angeles and kill millions of Americans. Now that's not going to be allowed to happen, by the way. They were already on notice from um, President Trump and Secretary of State uh, Rex Tillerson that uh, they have to back off or we will um, we'll engage in preemptive war. So you can foresee a, a war in, in North Korea coming uh, perhaps sooner than later because of these nuclear ambitions. But the point is this, the step from Bangladesh in dollars and digital dollars from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York through hacking and other uh, cyber warfare means is not just stealing money, it's stealing money to use to attack the United States with nuclear weapons. So this shows how geopolitics and global capital markets are, are meshed and mer uh, merged. Uh, and I talk about that specifically in the book, in, in the first two chapters. Chapter one of the death of money um, is about uh, my work with the uh, CIA and financial counterterrorism and insider trading uh, in advance of 9-11 uh, and our efforts to build a system, which we did successfully, that could detect insider trading and uh, and therefore detect and disrupt future terrorist plots. Uh, the CIA, we were not the police. Uh, we were not as interested in tracking down the, the, the pre-9-11 financial perpetrators. That was the job of the FBI and the SEC. But our job is to look at that experience and say, how could we apply it going forward as an intelligence agency to spot the next attack, which we did and we built a working prototype that, uh, as I say, uh, uh, worked, worked very well. Uh, but beyond that, just to kind of broaden the horizon, in chapter two of The Death of Money, I talk about financial warfare, specifically a financial war with Iran in 2012, 2013. What's interesting about that, uh, in the three years since the book has come out, um, President Obama declared a truce in that war in order to pursue 
uh, his uh, nuclear negotiations with Iran, that has now fallen apart. The Trump administration is backing away from that. The sanctions are coming back. So things I talked about um, in the book in 2014 are now back front and center. And I talked about that in the new preface, as I say, there is new material in the paperback edition of The Death of Money that addresses this specifically. But we're really back where we were in 2013. We're back into financial war with Iran. So we're in financial war with Iran, financial war with Russia because of sanctions involving Ukraine and um, Eastern Ukraine and Crimea, financial war with North Korea where they are very aggressive. Uh, and these financial weapons are waiting in the wings to be used in other cases. So. Um, this is front and center. This is the new world of 21st century warfare. It's not kinetic, it's digital, it's cyber, it's financial. And again, we talk about all that in the book. Yeah, thank you, Jim. That's uh, all the time I have. It's, uh, it's a great, great, great book uh, uh, to read, uh, always timely. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, you have the four books over here. If uh, uh, I personally advise somebody to start with currency wars and read all four of them, because they cover, and that's why I did that preamble at the beginning, because there's nobody that, uh, that I read that has such a good understanding of the international monetary system from the beginning, 19, uh, uh, let's, let, let's say the, the modern beginning of, uh, since uh, 1944, and uh, uh, you build the case uh, very well of what's going to happen. And each one, if you, if you reread those books, uh, uh, they come out uh, exactly as you, uh, as you predicted. It's, uh, the, 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 your own knowledge is just, uh, just fantastic. And uh, you also continue in your newsletter, you update uh, the material very, very well, uh, and, and you have exceptional uh, insider, I, I call it insider information, information that you don't read anywhere else. So uh, thank you very much, Jim, again for uh, uh, coming to, to, uh, for an interview with me. Uh, the last one, as I said, was just before the election, and uh, looking forward for the, for the next, uh, next book. But, uh, for the moment, uh, read those uh, those four ones. Thank you very much again, Jim. Thank you, Dan.